Okay, so let's uh, start by just sitting comfortably, sitting up comfortably, and just settling into the silence for a couple of minutes. Not trying to meditate, not trying to accomplish anything. not trying to experience anything special. Just resting, just resting in the awareness that's already right here. Just resting in the presence, the beingness that's always right here. Simplest thing in the world. This awareness, this beingness, naturally wide open like the sky. Okay, and let's just take a minute to slowly open the eyes. Take your time. Okay, so today we're going to talk, we're going to start talking about Emily Dickinson. Um, I'm pretty confident we'll want to continue with her for a couple of Sundays because she's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I sent you all in the last newsletter a uh, portrait, whoop, that's the wrong Wrong one. Uh, th this is actually the only known photograph. Huh. Are you seeing the photograph? Are you seeing? Huh. Wow. I'm seeing the wrong thing. Strange. Uh, my Zoom has given me some problems. Okay. Uh, so if you're seeing the photograph, that's the only, that's the only known photograph of Emily Dickinson as, as an adult. Um, there, there's a few that have shown up in recent years that people theorize might be her, but they haven't been authenticated. Um, also, um, we do have a painting. You're seeing this painting now? 
Okay, so that's the painting of Emily and her brother and sister when they were children. That's her on the far left with the flaming red hair. So when you look at the black and white photo of her, you've got to, with your imagination, fill in the, the red hair. Uh, Emily Dickinson's biography, we can sum up pretty much in three words. She stayed home. Emily stayed home. She was this incredibly brilliant young woman she, who was the, um, the, the daughter of a very prominent family. Her father was, they lived in Amherst, Mass. She spent her life there. Uh, her father was uh, a U.S. congressman for a while. I think he was the, he was the president of the uh, university there for a while. And so all the prominent people, all the prominent intellectuals, the thinkers, the poets, the architects, the, the politicians, everyone came to the Dickinson home for dinner. And she interacted with all of them at, at the dinner table. She briefly went to Mount Holyoke uh, to college. She, she went, I think, one year there and tops and never went back. And there's still some questions about why she wound up staying home in the way that she did. Um, her, her mother was sickly and needed a lot of help, and a lot of that just, just fell on young Emily. But also, she was confronted by a lot of death from an early age. This was the time in the mid-19th century when uh, she was born in 1830 uh, and died in 18, I think, 86. Um, she, so, and this was the time in the mid-19th century where there was... You, talk about, you know, pan, your pandemic, your epidemic, there was an ongoing rolling epidemics of tuberculosis, which in the, at that time was called consumption because it tends to consume your body. You become just very thin and wasted, highly contagious. They didn't know how to treat it, how to control it. And when you read the lives of the poets from that era in England, in the United States, whatever. It's, and then this person close to them died of consumption. And then this one died of consumption. So she saw that happen over and over and, you know, needed answers. For She briefly became a zealous, uh, uh, the, there were, there were um, uh, these kind of Christian revivals happening and she went to one and a lot of her friends Okay, they did it. They had the born again conversion, and she kind of tried it out. She managed to get born again, and it lasted for about a week because she was too intellectually she was too tough she was she she was too she kept asking questions she had to experience things in a deeper way in a in a real or more authentic way on her own. She could see that that for a lot of her friends who were having that conversion experience, there was a kind of um, talking yourself into it. And she was too honest to, to do that. So she wound up mostly staying home. She became known as a baker. Mostly she became known as a gardener. Very few people knew that she wrote poems. Uh, she was, those of you who were with us uh, when we spent a couple of weeks on Gerard Manley Hopkins, right, the misfit priest, who was busy kind of inventing modern poetry in England and not publishing any of it, she was doing the same thing. Uh, she, she was very interested in getting published, tried a few times, co was corresponding with people, usually older men, that she would get these very intense correspondences with, and some of them published magazines. And uh, f very few of her poems were published, and then they, and the publishers changed them because they were too weird. They changed the wording, they changed the punctuation. Um, and she basically stopped trying to get published. Um, and what she did was she mostly stayed at, more and more stayed at home the older she got. After a while, she stopped going out. After a while, when visitors came to the door, she would talk 
to them through the door. She wouldn't even open the door. She got to a place in her later years where she only wore white all the time. Uh, it was almost as if she had become a kind of intuitively, a kind of a nun, a kind of hermit, a kind of, of um, you know, she was a sannyasin, really, um, in, 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 but in a culture that didn't have room for that. So she had to create that, a way to do that herself. And she did it in her father's household. And in fact, you can still go to the home. You can go to the Dickinson home. You can see the garden and you can go upstairs. Yafa and I did this a few years ago, upstairs to her bedroom. And they've, they've, still, they've got the white dress there on a, on a dress form. And what she did was she started writing out these little poems and putting them on little pieces of paper. And when she'd get a stack like this, of these little pieces of paper. And as you'll see, she wrote mostly little poems, so they work well on these little pieces of paper. She wrote them out, and then she'd take a stack of these little pieces of paper and stab them twice on the left side, make two holes, and then put a ribbon through it and bind them into these little booklets. And then she would put the booklets in her drawer and not show them to anyone. And she did that for years. No one knew she was doing this until she died and they found um, a total of I think it's 1776 1776 little poems a few of them she had also sent to friends and letters most of them no one had ever seen them and it took years decades for them to be published properly because there were fights in the family about custody of the the manuscripts and so forth there's a lot of family soap opera built in, which we don't have time to talk about. So she wrote these little poems. And like a good hermit, a good sannyasin, what she was doing up there in that bedroom, it turned out, was getting awakened. <laughs> she was discovering, she was discovering the things that we experience and the things that we talk about in our Dharma practice. Uh, but she was not plugged into a tradition. She didn't have v vocabulary, the vocabulary that you know we've inherited from the traditions. She had to create her own language to talk about it. And she did that in her poems. And in some, way it's, in some ways it's really great that she had to invent her own vocabulary because um, she was so uncompromising. She was so um, honest and so um, tough and precise with her words that we we wind up hearing about this the tr the truths of awakening in a in a completely fresh way. So, um, before we get to the first poem, any any comments, questions? Anyone have? Let me. Give, I'll give you the ability to unmute yourselves. Uh... So any questions or comments about any of this before we go on? Okay. So, um, okay. So, uh, if, if you have this book, The Enlightened Heart, uh, first poem that I want to read is, is on page 116. First, just listen. If you've got the book, don't, don't look at the page because there's difficulties when you start looking at the page. I'll, I'll talk you through those in a minute. So just let this go through your ears, into your, into your brain, into your heart. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb as sponges buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for heft them 
pound for pound, and they will differ if they do as syllable from sound. Okay. All right. Let's take our shoes off and run through this. So if you're, <laughs> you now have permission to look at the page. And the first thing that you probably notice, and this is a little difficulty in reading Emily Dickinson, is all those dashes. All those dashes, which were a peculiarity of the way she wrote. You can find now facsimiles. If you go online, just Google Emily Dickinson poems manuscript. And you can find scans, digital reproductions of her, of the stuff from her hand. And she wrote, she, she didn't use regular punctuation. She just put in all these, da what we call dash, they're lines, for lack of a better word, we call them dashes. But some were short, some were long, some slanted, some of them went straight up. And, you know, some people have spent their lives looking at these, these lines and trying to decode, was she using these in a price, precise way? Does a line that slants up to the right mean something different from one that slants down? Or was she just kind of going Psh, with her pen and are the differences accidental <laughs> and, and people are making themselves crazy going down the rabbit hole of trying to decode them? And in fact, for years, when, when, when her poems were first published, they, they gave them regular punctuation. They put in periods and commas and things that may or may not uh, accurately reflect the, the sense of the poem. So nowadays, usually, they, they put the dashes back. But they're kind of distracting when you first try to read them because you can't read them like the way we usually use dashes. So I pretty much ignore them. <laughs> it's the bottom line. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease, and you beside. Okay. Let's take the first line. The brain is wider than the sky. That's, that's, that's the whole premise of the poem. Is that saying something to you? Does that sound familiar at all? The sense of that? Uh, please feel free to chime in here. That's, uh, yeah, Lulu. Um, my understanding is she's talking about the consciousness itself, yeah. which we think it's in the brain, but in reality is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, very often when we're when we're talking about awareness, beingness, talking about meditation, um, you know, a number of teachers, myself included. We'll, we'll compare that with sky-like. This is, you know, those of you who've, who've practiced in the Vajrayana, Tibetan Buddhism, it's used all the time, sky-like awareness. This, this the, the closest thing, that namkai, the this, this sky, the spiritual sky, the, the, because awareness is not like anything. It's like nothing. You know, any, all the things that we experience are experienced within awareness. We're aware of them. Um, but the closest we can say to some idea of it is that awareness is like the sky. It's, it's like space, open space, space-like, sky-like. And, you know, we can say, and we often do say, in all our experiences, the things we're aware of pass through this sky-like awareness, just as clouds and rainbows and rain pass through the sky, but they don't affect the sky. They don't diminish it. They don't enhance it. They don't dent it. They don't damage it. So when she says the brain is wider than the sky, I think she's saying the same thing. I think that when she's saying brain, she means the same thing as we mean when we say awareness or consciousness. Okay. It would be more accurate. It would be more precise to say awareness rather than brain, which implies a physical organ. But this tells you something about her style. 
she is her she has this tough plain straightforward monosyllabic style right and this is this is 70 years before Ernest Hemingway comes along and you know Hemingway made that kind of style famous but Emily Dickinson was sitting upstairs in her bedroom doing it 70 years before Hemingway way before it was cool and in particular for a woman to write this way when women if they wrote at all were expected in the mid 19th century the middle of the Victorian era women were expected to write in this very flowery way and using the longest words they could I mean women and men um, but especially women so here she is just you know with the luxury of being a hermit of not being published of not having people looking over her shoulder of putting the poems in the drawer and and not having to get everyone's you know stupid opinion about them she was able to really push that style that tough monosyllabic style that just feels like as real and solid as a rock yeah you know rock the brain now she'll never use a word with more than one syllable unless she has to which is by the way often very good advice for one's own writing um you know you never use a long word when a short word will will do the trick which is exactly the opposite of what a lot of especially you know the years i spent teaching english at, at, at the fancy prep school in New Jersey, where, where kids, when they sit down to write papers for school, they're always trying to use the longest words possible. You know, I have to slap them around and say, no, no, do the opposite. Because the short, the smaller, what we want to do is get the words out of the way so the reality can shine through. And the more syllables we clutter it up with, the harder it is for the reality, the actual experience to get through. We want to get fewer and fewer syllables, more and more experience. Ultimately, what we want to do is get down to one syllable that, ex that conveys the experience of the whole universe. We never get there. Maybe with OM. <laughs> you know, that might do it. But we're always, we never get there. But that's, and I would tell my students, this is, this is the ideal to always be striving for, trying to describe the whole universe in one syllable. See how close you can get to that. So, the brain is wider than the sky, right? We look at the sky, the physical sky, and it just seems, you know, that's the vastness, the endlessness of space. And she's saying that awareness is wider, which makes sense because we experience space. Space is the, the most vast, most subtle, most um, abstract thing we can think of in 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 our physical universe and awareness but we're aware of space so awareness is subtler wider vaster than that less substantial than space and it's this awareness that you're experiencing right now the 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 awareness within which these words are resonating right now the brain is wider than the sky for put them side by side the one the other will contain with ease right in other words awareness can contain the sky with ease and you beside there's room for, and there's room for you in there <laughs> as well there's room there's room whatever you are which seems to be very closely connected with the intimacy of awareness the vastness of sky it's all kind of conflated together here The brain, second stanza, the brain is deeper than the sea. Right, so these are all the things that we think of as like immeasurably vast, the sky, the sea. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb as sponges buckets do. Right? Are you seeing that image? Right? We say... Okay, what's bigger, a bucket full of water or a sponge? Well, a bucket full of water is bigger, but, you know, we take the sponge and start, 
and can start absorbing the water and pretty soon we've emptied out the bucket. So this is what our awareness can do. We, we, we could, it can take on whatever you got, bring it on. We, I, can, I can absorb that, I can comprehend that. And notice, by the way, the parallel structure as she goes from one stanza to the next. You can take it line by line, right? The first line of each stanza starts with the brain is, and then it compares it to something vast. Second line, for, right? And then goes on. The brain, third stanza, the brain is just the weight of God. Now, this is one of the reasons why writing in the middle of the 19th century, if you find yourself writing this stuff, you're going to just put it in the drawer and not share it. This is, this is not going to win you any friends, you know, uh, uh, in, the, in the local Episcopalian church or, what, or whatever you got. It's not a conventional way of thinking about God. You know, where God is a big daddy and he's, he's bigger than... Yeah, God is, is, is infinitely big and so is awareness. So is your awareness. The brain is just the weight of God for heft them, right? Heft them. <clears throat> feel, feel them, feel their weight. Lift them. For heft them pound for pound and they will differ, if they do, as syllable from sound. Now how does syllable differ from sound? It doesn't. A syllable is a sound. Right? It, it looks different. The word is different. You know? The word God is different from the word brain or awareness. Like syllable and sound. But they're the same thing. That's, we got your non-dualism du, non right there. That's Advaita. Right there. Pure Advaita. And I'm pretty sure she was never exposed to any, you know, traditional uh, 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 historical Advaita teachings from, from India. Those uh, manuscripts, those, those texts around the time that she lived were just being uh, first starting to filter into the West. Because of the British Raj, when, the, when well, first the French went into India and then the British... And following, you know, behind the soldiers came the priests and the scholars, and they they had to work hard at getting the pundits there to teach them Sanskrit. But eventually they did. They started translating the works, um, and a lot of them were first translated into French and German and then retranslated into English, slowly made their way into America. One of the first people to actually to to get a pretty good library of those texts from the East was Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, over in Concord, Mass. And, uh, and his disciple, Henry David Thoreau, borrowed the books. So they were influenced by them directly. Emily was at home at Amherst. She stayed home. She was upstairs. Uh, she would not have had a chance to read those texts. So she had to independently discover this, this non-dual truth within herself and put it in this kind of fresh expression. It's really extraordinary. Okay, we good? We good? You're getting a sense of the specialness of what she did here? You know, and it, most of us were exposed to Emily Dickinson at first in, you know, our high school English class and that maybe there should be a law against doing that because <laughs> I think most most high school students are not going to be ready to get with my, most high school English teachers unless they've got a background in in you know Advaita insight and and non dual meditation are they're not going to really get what this stuff's about. It's so profound. Yeah, Tova. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, when in the first stanza it says the one the other will contain and in the second one the one the other will absorb. Mm -hmm. 
are we assume, first of all, the brain, could it be the mind? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah I th again, when she says brain, I don't think she means the physical organ. So, so it's correct to go one step more abstract and say mind. I would go okay. yet another, because usually, you know, these words are, different people use these words in different ways. So, for example, in, in Zen writing, they'll often use the word mind to mean awareness. They'll talk about big mind, sky mind. Um, usually, teachers allied with Tibetan teaching and with, with Advaita will use mind to mean thinking, the conceptual mind, the thinking mind. And then to, when they're talking about just pure awareness, that sky-like thing that, is, that transcends thinking, we say awareness or consciousness. So here is my question. Yes. That was just a pre-question. Okay. Um, I, so the one the other will contain, mm -hmm. are, are we assuming that it is the first one, the brain will contain the sky or is it vice versa? That's a very interesting question. You, you could read it either way. Um, the sky but, will but but contain. but you know if we if you again there's this parallel structure from stanza to stanza and when we get to the second stanza right where we're talking about the 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 sponge holding the bucket absorbing the one the other will absorb it seems pretty clear that she's talking about the the first thing the brain is like the sponge can absorb the bucket full of water. So, but I don't know. I like what you're saying there. You know, it could be, you know, what in mathematics they call a, a, a commutative function. It, it, it works both ways. You know, if two plus two equals four, it must also be true that four equals two plus two. It goes in, in either direction. Um, yeah, that works that way too. Yeah. You know, God, awareness, sky, awareness, the sea. I mean, depends how literally we take these figures. If we, if we take them literally the sea, then, then, then awareness must be bigger than it. So then it's not going to be commutative. It's only going to go one way. But it's, a, it's pretty fine. Yeah, uh, 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 Jots now, you want to unmute yourself? Um, there you go. So I, I was thinking that there are clear parallels between um, the, you know, the, the brain or mind consciousness um, holds the same function in, in the first paragraph as it does in, in the second, in mm -hmm. the second one. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking that in, through consciousness, through my mind, I can, can I can, I can comprehend the sky. Yes. But not vice versa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's why my mind can take in something much vaster than, right. than right, that. Right, right, right. In terms of a consciousness. Yes, and I think that works for all three of the stanzas. You know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the mind can take in the ocean. The ocean can't take in the mind. Right. But, but, but then if we extend that logic to the third stanza, then it becomes uh, very um, bold. <laughs> the, the mind can comprehend God, but God cannot comprehend the mind. May That's I, very bold. May I say one more thing? Mm -hmm. so, you know, from, from the Indian philosophical, spiritual perspective, mm -hmm. um, the ultimate of whatever you want to call it, development, spiritual development, unfoldment, is not that I have found God, mm -hmm. but it is, the Sanskrit is aham brahmasmi, I am God. Right. right. I was, right. it's my ignorance that sets me apart, but I am that. Right. So, 
So. Yes. So it's, I, and, yeah, that's that's the ultimate discovery. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. I am, I am yeah. Brahman. I am the infinite. And the other aspect of that is that Atman, Atman, the 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 self is is Brahman. It par right. Atma and Paramatma. Right. Right. Atma, Paramatma, the supreme self, is non-different yes. from from the infinite. Yes. My that, ignorance that, sets me apart. Right. Atma. And of course, in, in, in Indian culture, we have all this wealth of, of gods, of devas, and, and a lot of, you know, fun stories where, where a god starts getting very excited about his or her status, and then you, yeah. usually it's, it's Brahma, Lord Brahma winds up getting humbled because the, the, the Brahman, that which is our ultimate mm -hmm. self, is, is so much bigger than Brahma, Lord Brahma, or any other god. So yes, that so this completely works in that model. Absolutely. Now I want to talk a little bit about the form of this, the poetic form, because it's it's quite interesting, and it's and it's and she uses this same poetic form in not in all of her poems, but in most of them. Um, you know, if you've got the book, if you if you um, they only have about three of her poems, but they all have the same form. First of all, they're all in what's called quatrains, which means, you know, four line verses, four line stanzas, quatrains. And they all have the same uh, metrical form, the same rhythm, which is da 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 a one, a two, a three, a four, a one, a two, a three. A one, a two, a three, a four, a one, a two, a three. Okay? Technically, if you're if you like hearing these long words, it's alternating lines of iambic tetrameter and iambic trimeter. Okay. Iambic just means it's the rhythm da da. I call it reverse march time. You know, march time is da da, left, right, left, right. This is left, right, left, right. It's syncopated, da da, da da. And it does it four times in the first line, then three times in the next line, then four times, then three times. A one, a two, a three, a four, a one, a two, a three. Why, out of all the forms, all the metrical forms that she could use, Right. For example, the most popular metrical form in English is iambic pentameter. You you do five of them per line, starting from all the way back in the 1400s with Chaucer through Shakespeare and through to the most of the poets of Emily Dickinson's time. A one, a two, a three, a four, a five. A one, a two, a three, a four, a five. Um to be or not to be, that is the question, right? Shakespeare is mostly iambic pentameter. Why does she do this? One way you can remember it, by the way, is Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. A one, a two, a three, a four, a one, a two, a three. And that's the clue. It's a hymn. She wrote her poems making these bold statements of non-dual insight in the form of hymns. Do you see the brilliance of that? She's, she's giving them like sacred status. She's, she's making them worthy of something to be sung in church by the number of, by the, the, by the, the rhythm of them, the, the number of syllables in a line. She's kind of almost subliminally giving them the, the status the weight of a of a sacred hymn, right? So if you if you're ever testing to see whether a poem is by Emily Dickinson, the first thing is is try singing it to the tune of Amazing Grace, and see if it works. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, right? It always works. <laughs> okay. Okay.
What fascinates me is her use of capital letters. Yeah, you know, and that goes along with um, what we were saying earlier about the, the dashes and her whole vocabulary of different kinds of dashes that may have been arbitrary or may be very specific in their meaning. And, you know, how specific is she in her and how deliberate is she in her use of capital letters? If if you really want to get a, a hold of that, you know, do Google it and, and take a look at her her manuscripts, which you can find. Mm -hmm. Just Google Emily Dickinson manuscripts and you can find them in her in her hand, in her penmanship. Mm -hmm. Um, generally, what you're seeing here is that the nouns are capitalized. And um, once upon a time, more people did that. You know, in German, I believe, nouns are always capitalized. Uh, I, don't, I don't write German or speak it, but, but I believe that's the case. And, uh, and when you, you look at older, you know, earlier English, that, that people often do that. So it's not, it's not too unusual. Um, I want to look at uh, next uh, one that's on page 114. It's just a little fragment. And some of her, some of the things that we have from her, they're not whole poems. They're just little fragments like this. Or maybe she wrote a little fragment, you know, she, she jotted this stuff down. A lot of it was on the backs of, of, you know, scraps of paper, on the backs of envelopes, on the backs of recipes. We also have a bunch of recipes in her hands. You can, you can, if you, there's a, there's a, Harvard has a site because Harvard uh, is, has, is now the, the repository of all her papers and they've digitized it all. And you can find the recipes. You could, you could bake cakes. <laughs> with Emily Dickinson's recipes. Um, so one of the things that, that was uncovered after she died that they pulled out of the drawer was this on a little scrap of paper, these two lines. Not revelation tis that waits, but our unfurnished eyes. Not re revelation tis that waits, but our unfurnished eyes. Oh, man. It was so brilliant that she stopped right there. Because that says it all. That says it all. Right? Are you hearing this? Everyone's looking for the revelation. Everyone's looking for the aha moment. Right? Everyone's looking for, uh, you know, if, if, if you're sp specifically, um, um, uh, if you're religiously inclined, you're looking for what we literally would think of as a revelation, right? God speaks to you and says, quote, blah, 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 period, close quote. There it is. Here's the revelation. I can come down from the mountain. We've inscribed this on tablets. Share this with everyone. Here's the truth. Right? Everyone would like to have. When I was a kid, I used to have dreams of like going into a cave and there resting on a rock was a, a book that was the book of ultimate wisdom. And I would read it and read these words and go, Whoa, there it is. There's ultimate truth. And then I would wake up and try to remember what it said. And of course, I could never remember. Maybe some of you have had similar experiences. I don't know. Um, and, and I think for a lot of people, for a lot of people who are not necessarily interested in religion per se, and who would not say, oh, I'm... Um, I'm looking for a revelation. They're still looking for a revelation. They're looking for that ultimate aha, but they're just looking for it somewhere else. They're looking for it in um, maybe as an aesthetic revelation, like this movie. You got to see this movie. This is it. You got to read, 
you got to read this book. This book, this is it. This is the ultimate. This is, you know, it goes back to when we were little kids. Mommy, mommy, Christmas is coming. Please buy me the Barbie doll or the G.I. Joe, right? If you just bring buy me the Barbie doll, that'll be it. I'll never ask for anything again. You know, and we really believed it, didn't we? We really believed it. And, you know, like, oh, this is the thing. If I get only get this, it's going to make me so happy. My head will explode. And, and I won't have the, the ability to ever have another desire. <laughs> right? And then being, you know, growing up in the America, the land of prosperity, most of us got the Barbie dollar. We got the G.I. Joe. And it really did seem like it for 15 minutes, you know, and then the thing, you know, remember that time and, you know, on the afternoon of December 25th, when all the joy and the excitement, you know, the big, great sugar rush of, of opening all the presents under the tree, and then the sugar rush of eating the candy canes, the literal sugar rush, all that wore off somewhere around four in the afternoon on December 25th, when you started feeling depressed, <laughs> and you started coming down from, from the high, but it's, can I yes. just interject? It's not just the Barbie doll. I mean, I think adults feel that like if I could only get my kid in a good school or if I can only have that, get that job or whatever, it's, it's not just, you know, a Barbie doll situation. I think there's always that feeling that my life will be, com you know, calm and together if yeah. this, and often it is big things like, you right. know, get that job, but no. Yeah, that's where I'm going. That's that. That's the next paragraph in my little sermon here, right? That that then we just as we get older, our our the the Barbie doll, we just get different forms, more and more sophisticated forms, and more and more, um, you know, reasonable forms like getting the kid into the good college. That's obviously a much more worthy goal, less selfish, less materialistic than the Barbie doll. But the dynamics, the mechanics of how the consciousness works, of the expectation, oh, we just get this thing, then that'll be it, everything will be fine, then we'll be at peace. Then we'll say, ah, once and for all. That's the revelation. We're looking for, it's like our awareness, we're looking for something to fill the awareness right? But it never works. It can seem like it's working for a while. And this is one of the reasons why some of the most malignant people in the world are people who can get unlimited material stuff. You know, they can build their towers and have their yachts, have everything made of gold, and, and, they, and it keeps not being enough. And we know why it is. It's because the brain is wider than the sky, right? Because awareness is infinite, Anything we try to fill it up with, whether it's the kid getting into college or the yacht or getting elected president or whatever it is, it's not going to fill it up. It's not going to satisfy. And so, you know, we can, we can wind up getting more and more destructive, psychotic, w desperate, whatever, trying to do this impossible thing of filling infinite awareness fulfilling it with a finite something. It's like having a stomach that's infinitely big. We can't get a sandwich big enough to fill it. So look what Emily Dickinson tells us here. Uh, what page was that? I dropped my... Th oh, here we go. 114. 114, thank you. Not revelation tis that waits, but our unfurnished eyes right? It's not some great final epiphany or object or orgasm or anything that's going to finally come and fill the awareness. It's the awareness itself. The eyes, by eyes here, I'm, I, I'm, seems very clear to me, but she's using eyes, again, in her tough Hemingway-esque concrete monosyllabic style, she's using eyes, meaning the faculty of seeing, the faculty of, of knowing, of being aware, to mean awareness, and awareness is wider than the sky. So if we want to find fulfillment, if we want to find that final, ultimate ah, we have to stop looking for revelation. 
whether it's in a spiritual text or in an experience or in an accomplishment or in anything, stop trying to fill the awareness with that and just let the awareness rest in itself. Find it in its own infinite nature. Nothing else will do. Everything else we try to fill it with is going to be finite. No matter, but, but of course what we do is we keep saying, oh, well, that didn't work. Okay, let me try the next thing. Let me try the next thing. Somewhere inside we have the wisdom. I think all those people, you know, sitting in the bar, okay, the next drink will do it. The next girl or guy that I hook up with, that'll do it. I think they, that we all have enough innate wisdom to know somewhere inside, no, it's not going to really work. But, you know, I don't know what else to do. Right, And isn't it just so interesting and so fortunate for us that here's this brilliant woman, Emily Dickinson, who it, it sat home, she didn't get engaged with this stuff and uh, had this simplified life and, and the brilliant penetrating awareness to, to, to figure this stuff out and put it in this incredibly powerful, simple poetic form. Really, there's no one else like her. Yes, Lulu. Um, in these two liners that you just read, mm -hmm. <clears throat> she, what she is saying is we are the awareness. All we have to do is recognize it. Yeah, yeah. And, and stop looking for something else. Stop looking, stop looking for something else to, to fill it. Stop looking. And, and it's important to know that she wrote this at a time, right. right? The 1840s, the 1850s was a time of great spiritual um, uh, ferment in, in the United States. You know, you had the, what was it called? The Second Great Awakening. You had all these, 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 um, uh, Christian uh, 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 revivals, like I mentioned, the one that she participated in as a as a as a teenager or young adult. Um, you also were starting to have the beginnings of, as I said, the the scriptures of the East coming west. Uh, you had new religions coming along. Um, uh, the um, uh, you had the beginning uh, Joseph Smith. So finding the the golden tablets that that gave the you know our one uh, uh, native-born American religion, which is the the Mormon religion. We have that coming along. You have great debates, people trying to figure out which is the true path. So you know everyone's looking for which is the revelation. <laughs> and here's this here's this little red-haired quite eccentric woman in her personal life. Uh, one of the men that she corresponded with, had these very intense spiritual correspondences with, um, finally came and met her. He was on a visit to Amherst, and he met her. And later on, he wrote in his journal, he said, I've never been with a person who was so draining. <laughs> he, said, he, he said, I'm so grateful that I don't live anywhere near her. <laughs> right. Um, and we can imagine that, uh, and, and we see this a lot. We saw it with Hopkins. When you're out there on your, you know, we have the luxury. We, we're so fortunate. We have a sangha here. We have, we have friend, like-minded friends, and we have, we have teachings, and we have ways to um, incrementally, systematically integrate the vision of boundlessness with our everyday life of, of boundaries so that you know things don't go our, our our grip on on the finite doesn't get all knocked to hell by our experiences of the infinite you know when you don't have that luxury when you don't have the sangha when you don't have the teachings when when you're out there on your own it can be kind of overwhelming and 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 you might sort of start becoming kind of eccentric or maybe it's the other way that that only kind of eccentric individuals people who are different who are not fitting into the 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 usual 
socially accepted pattern are going to go out on their own and discover this stuff, or maybe some of each. You know, and we see this a lot. We see this over and over. We'll we'll see it with with Walt Whitman when we get to him. We'll probably do him next. But but clearly next week we're going to do more Emily Dickinson. So. Thank you so much, everyone. Mm -hmm. And may all beings swiftly realize that they can stop looking for a revelation. <laughs> that it's their un... And notice the unfurnished eyes. Like we, we didn't talk about that word, unfurnished. All you got to do is remove the crap. Just, just use your windshield. The eyes are there. You know, Lulu, as you said, the nature of awareness itself is infinite, but most of us, you know, the, the usual metaphor is like the mirror. It's like the mirror. It reflects the infinite, but, but it has dust. We have to do something to clean the dust from it. We have, to, we have to have it unfurnished, like an unfurnished room, like an empty room. Right? She did that with her life. She did that with her lifestyle. Remove the, the complications. Make it, you know, anyone who chooses a monastic life is essentially doing that. And that can be, a, for some people, a great help. The deepest, the, the, the really deep monasticism, which you can do in an outwardly monastic life or, you know, living in the suburbs or living in the city and going to work and, and having a family, which is finally the uncluttered awareness on the inside. So may all beings swiftly discover their unfurnished eyes and may all beings there thus be happy and may all conflict give way to peace. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Take care. See you around. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> and um, yeah, Tova. And, and, and Yafa, if, if you guys, oh, Yafa left, she'll come back. Okay, so see you all later. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, I'm going to stay on. I, a couple people I have to chat with here. I'll, Tova, I'll be right back. Yeah. Hi, Afa. Do you think we need to start a new Zoom? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll Zoom with you. Okay, in a few minutes. okay to, yeah, Tova, I'll email you a, a link for a new meeting right now. Okay. 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 Bye, y'all. <laughs>